First of all, I want to thank you all for coming to our open house. This is very exciting. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, I'm Janet Ellsworth. Uh, I'm married in Ellsworth, who is, I have a as we say, loosely connected with the, with the um, founder of Ellsworth. So one of the things that, that I wanted to do was, was help sort of orient those of you who may have momentarily forgotten um, about President James Madison and Oliver Ellsworth, and, and how did they, how did they um, sort of interact going back? So, so I did like, I went back to high school and did that old compare and contrast thing that, that we were all taught to do. And um, just, just a couple little facts to, to help, um, help us sort of get back into the mode of the, the 1780s. So James Madison, as, as we all know, was born in Virginia in 1751, and he died at age 84 in 1836. So, 51 to 1836. Oliver Ellsworth, and this is his house that we were in, was born here in Windsor in 1745. So six years before James Madison was born. But he died at 62. So he died uh, at a much younger age. Um, and he died in 1807, and he, he died in this house also. Interestingly, uh, both of them were educated at the College of New Jersey, which became Princeton. Um, Oliver took a, uh, he first started out at Yale, and you've probably all heard the story, and Yale was not a good match, he was a bit of a prankster, left Yale and went to what was to become Princeton. Uh, he was there about, uh, three years before James Madison was there, and, and one of the things about Princeton is, is um, it was a, a, an amazing gathering place for the founding fathers. So many of the, the individuals that we think of as being uh, really founding fathers for uh, that period of time did go to Princeton. Uh, James Madison married um, Dolly Payne Todd when he was 43, so he was, he was pretty old, and I don't believe that they had any children. Um, Oliver Ellsworth married Abigail Wolcott when he was 27, so 46, 27, and they had nine children, seven of which um, survived into adulthood. They were both members of the Continental Congress, and they were both members of the Constitutional Convention. And we may hear more about that later. Um, Madison wrote the Federalist Papers. He wrote 29 out of the 85 Federalist Papers. Uh, uh, Oliver Ellsworth um, had much more of a state orientation, but, but um, was a drafter of the Constitution also, and um, was a key architect of the Judiciary Act. Madison, brilliant, persuasive, eloquent, and much more of a political animal than Oliver Ellsworth, who was much more of a pragmatist. He was, a, uh, he was very prudent. He was a problem solver. He was a New Englander. Um, he was a Congregationalist, uh, a Puritan, and, and new divinity theology really helped um, to form his, his political life. Um, James Madison, back in 1770, was uh, five inches five feet, four inches tall, and about 100 pounds. So he was uh, much uh, more on the short side. Um, our guy here was, is described over six feet, impressive stature, and personal gravitas. So I hope that sort of helps uh, uh, help you sort of, uh, get a little more of a framework. So at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Wait, James Smith. Again, six what? Over six feet. Oh, you yeah. know. Oh. And then five four. And five four. And um, um, Oliver was, you know, broad shouldered. And they played basketball. Big guy. <laughs> or football. I, I don't know which one. But, um, so I'm going to turn this over to James Madison, who is uh, ably portrayed by Bill Lewis, who very graciously agreed to drop in. He is doing a, a tour um, of the Northeast, and we're on his way. So and here is James Madison. Oh,
absolutely. Film, we're going to film, we would love to record it. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is an enormous honor to be here. A pleasure. This is the first time in I don't know how long I have been in Connecticut whatsoever. I should like to preface my remarks by the somewhat irritating observation that I know that in your modern times you were president of Warren G. Harding. Uh, coined this term, the Founding Fathers. In my time, we merely referred to ourselves as the Founders. And I have often been criticized for my support of women's education. But do I need to remind you that women were half of the population? I should gladly take you, Mr. Harding and put him in a room with Abigail Adams and see what he says after she has her way with him. <laughs> The essence of government is power. And power's twin sister, whose name is? Money. <laughs> All of politics is about power and money. Taking it from one group of people and giving it to another. And if you do not know who is getting the power and money, well, it's not you. That's a change. I am known as the father of the Constitution, an honor which I have turned down many times. Yes, I am responsible in a huge part for it happening, but so were many others. The father of the Bill of Rights, however, that is accurate. I had originally opposed having a Bill of Rights as I thought it unnecessary. A parchment barrier will not stop a tyrant. But there was so much pressure for it that I relented and said that, yes, I shall introduce a Bill of Rights at the first uh, seating of Congress if we ratify the Constitution now. And so I collected 120 suggestions from the different states, whittled down, down to 20, and the 10 with which we are familiar are those that Congress finally passed. <clears throat> two, two amendments which did not make it through were a prohibition against economic monopolies and a prohibition against a standing army. How different the country would have turned out if those two had come through. <laughs> Nonetheless, our concerns at the time, more than anything else, were that America should become a single country. The danger, of course, is that we should remain separate states and indeed become separate countries and we would devolve into Europe endless warfare. And so more than anything else, it was essential that we be able to bring ourselves together and build the country that we wanted. In 1785, as you probably remember, the Articles of, Con of Confederation had proven massively inadequate. All 13 states had to agree to taxation, something they never did. And our soldiers went without food, went without clothing, went without shelter. This could not remain. Well, we had a conference in Annapolis, there it was, in 85, in, in which it was going to be, uh, we were going to do some navigation discussions, but only five states showed. We were depressed, but uh, not Mr. Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton insisted that this was our top opportunity, that we had to go back to Congress and establish a constitutional convention. Congress did not approve. Uh, so I spoke to my friend, Alex Vander, on the side and advised him to rephrase his proposal, that we should have a convention to fix the deficits in the Articles of Convention, Con uh, <coughs> the Articles of Co Confederation. Now, now, one way to fix the Articles of Confederation, of course, is to throw them out and start all over again, but we didn't need to mention that to Congress. So they approved the convention. All we needed to do was get 13 states to show. And the only way that that could possibly happen is if 
General Washington attended. I spoke to him. I had worked with him at the end of the war, close in Congress, and he declined. He did not want to risk his honor in such a questionable and dubious enterprise, but he did not directly refuse, which allowed me to go to each of these states and talk to them individually, quietly in the background. This is what I was good at, talking quietly in the background to people. I was not a great orator, like Patrick Henry or anything, but I was very, very good at talking to people, understanding what their concerns were, and finding ways to integrate their concerns with our concerns. Compromise, I tell you. Compromise. And so, I went to each of the states. They agreed to come, except for Rhode Island. <clears throat> and hence, George Washington assented, and we had our convention. We from Virginia came two weeks early, set up what we know as the Virginia Plan. And then, in the convention, we lost all major debates. I wanted the Senate to be apportioned by population. It is two per state. I wanted Congress to have nullification over state laws that violated the Constitution. Instead, we got a vague notion of states' rights. And more than anything else, I wanted to end the hideous practice of slavery. And all we got was an end to the importation of Africans. Nonetheless, we got the most important thing that we wanted, which was a country. <laughs> I told, that, told you that I lost the battle on nullification to, among others, Oliver Ellsworth who, upon being elected to the Senate, then wrote and passed the Judiciary Act of 1789, granting nullification to the Supreme Court, and hence I got my nullification, just not the way that I was expecting it. And perhaps in retrospect, it is better this way, could you imagine Congress looking over the shoulders of every state law that has ever passed? <laughs> Oliver Ellsworth was a very, very impressive individual. He, coming from Connecticut, of course, he came from the most stable of, of the colonies. As part of the New Light Calvinist, he believed in the concept of toleration, that it is better to tolerate a man's foibles to draw him to task and punish him for every little sin that he commits. And it is this attitude that allowed him and others to make the compromises required for us to have our country. <sighs> but let me review what I have some notes here. I wish to make sure that I do not forget my major concerns. Hmm. Uh, he was less willing to separate from the mother country immediately than the rest of us. Jefferson and I were purists. We were true Republicans. We must fight, fight, <coughs> fight. And he was more willing to hold back. And he and Dickinson worked on the Olive Branch proposal. That, that perhaps there was still a way to reconcile with the mother country. And because the king summarily refused even to see them, that gave empathy, ah, that gave more power to those of us who wanted, of course, the separation. As the country came, my major concern, as I said in Federalist 10, was factions, different groups, different political parties. In particular, wealth. The most common and durable source of factions has always been the various and unequal distributions of property. Those who hold and those who are without property have ever formed distinct interests in society. In 1776, the richest 1% of our population held over 6% of the total wealth in America. I was very concerned about the level of inequality, and, and I was 
horrified when Alexander Hamilton proposed we should use federal tax monies to support manufacturers. Because if you own your farm, you are an independent individual. You are not so dependent on anyone else. But if you work in manufacturing, you, you need someone else to give you employment. And can you truly say that you are an independent, self-thinking individual if you are so dependent on someone else for your livelihood? Oh, which is why Jefferson and I were so concerned that we should become an agricultural paradise. Well, we were dreaming about that one. <clears throat> and then, the Prop National Bank. The first bank of the United States, a bank that would have the issuance power of money, a private bank that could issue money. Uh, let me show you what my good friend, my best friend in the world, Thomas Jefferson, had to say about this issue. Is there anyone with a loud voice who would like to read Jefferson's words for me? Right here. Sir, would you be so kind as to read in loud and virulent voice his concerns? If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and the corporations that will grow up around them will deprive people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent that their fathers conquered. What do you think of that? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Yeah. Uh, and yet, it worked. I there was great speculation. The rich got much richer with this bank, but the common man got money. Shea and his regulators, you've heard of, they were not complaining that they shouldn't pay their taxes, they were complaining that they had no money to pay them with. And the First Bank of the United States supplied that money. And so after all of my opposition to it, when it came for renewal, I proposed that we should renew the bank in 1816. Again, compromise. We do not always know the best route in our own minds, and it's only by dealing with other people and admitting to their concerns that we can produce the country that we want. <laughs> in 1794, I was 43 years old, still a bachelor, presumed for life. The yellow fever had just descended on Philadelphia the previous year, wiping out 10% of the population in three months. 10% of the population in three months, including the husband of a young lady, Dolly Payne Todd. I saw this woman, oh, she was beautiful. Men would walk, stand on the street corners just to walk, watch her walk by. <laughs> I was determined that I should meet this woman, and so I asked my friend, who owed me a favor, Aaron Burr, if he would introduce me to her. I must admit that I was also concerned that Mr. Burr had his eyes on her. <laughs> and by having him introduce me to her, this took him completely out of the picture. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me, there is this absolutely charming note that Dolly wrote. Oh, is there someone who would be kind enough to read these three lines of the just make me cry. Could you be so kind as to read those three lines that Dolly wrote? Dear friend, thou must come to me. Aaron Burr says that the great little Madison has asked to be brought to see me this evening. <laughs> Is that not lovely? <laughs> and that's what they call me, the great little Madison. And I was great. And Dolly recognized that. Three months I had to chase her until she finally said yes. And then we had the best 
possible life together. No couple had ever been happier than Dolly and me. Uh, uh, Mr. Coatsworth, when he was running against me for president, he was quoted as saying, if I had only run against Mr. Madison, I might have won. But I had to run against his wife also. <laughs> <laughs> was she related to uh, Mary Todd Lincoln? Yes, I believe they were cousins. I think all of us sooner or later were related. I do not remember the precise details, so... Okay, I'm just kidding. As president, we had parties, levees, dinners, dances, continuously. Seven nights a week sometimes, which my wife organized and oversaw our squeezes. It was so tight in the president's mansion that you couldn't even move. You were squeezed to death. And we invited everyone, Federalist and Republicans, the same party. The richest man in America might be bumping shoulders with a dirt farmer from upstate Pennsylvania. This is the America that we wanted for all the people. We are very proud of it, and it was Dolly who made it happen. <laughs> a guest to one of our squeezes noted the following occurrence. <clears throat> Dolly had noticed that a young man, a young Federalist uh, senator, was very nervous and he was standing up against the wall drinking his tea. Dolly came over to make him more comfortable and in his nervousness he dropped his saucer upon the floor, stuffed his teapot cup into his pocket. <laughs> and Dolly said to him, it is so crowded in here, isn't it? It is so difficult. I shall have the servant bring you a new cup of tea. And, now, your <coughs> mother, did I not know your mother? And engaged him in conversation. <laughs> this is the essence of this is the essence of being human. This is the essence of what it means to be truly just a good human being. And that is what my wife was. We were <coughs> so happy together. <laughs> May I ask one more person to read this most delightful quotation? There's someone who would be kind enough to read this little quotation from an event that happened at the President's Mansion. I guess. Right there. The President and the Lady Presentess would, in private, sometimes romp and tease each other like two children and engage in antics that would astonish the muse of history. Mrs. Madison was stronger as well as larger than he. Really? Oh. <laughs> she could and did seize his hands, draw him upon her back, and go round the room with him. <laughs> <laughs> we were playing piggyback. Ah, <laughs> uh, and so. I had the best of life with the best of wives. We built a country of, I guess, all odds. <sighs> In so many ways, I'm content with our efforts. Most particularly that, of course, that we are a single nation. It is only slavery that has haunted me the rest of my life. Perverse, isn't it? The slaveholders, myself, Washington, Jefferson, Monroe, all dedicated to the abolition thereof, I became a strong supporter of the American Colonial Society, allowing 15,000 free black men to move back to Africa. But the truth is, the American Negro was no more confident about Africa than his master. They did not want to move back to Africa. They were Americans, and they intended to stay here. I did not try to free my slaves in my will. I could not because I was in debt, money. And if I had, they would have been taken and sold separately, just as Jefferson's slaves were sold to pay off his debts. I was fortunate that my wife was able to, upon my demise, arrange for each of the slave families to move together and be bought by our friends. Certainly not what I wanted, but it is better than what otherwise would have been followed by. 
I know that since my demise in 1836, this slavery has been abolished. I know that you have developed amazing machines producing marvelous products at a fraction of the labor that it took in my day. My only concern is these marvels be shared among all the people and all the citizens of the nation, that none be left behind, and that you, and that you can say, as we could not, that you have at last fulfilled the promise of 76. That all men, indeed all people, are created equal. That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And that among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. want to have conversation a bit, uh, I'm open if I'm sure that some of you have great insights. So Guarding that romp. <laughs> oh, well. I am just glad there were no news media people. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, said, you said that you had to go to each state and beg them to go to that convention. How long did it take to get... Oh. Are you to all of the representatives in Philadelphia. Okay. So I nearly had to go through a few different houses. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to just jump in. Thank you very much. Excuse me. I just want to um, Bill okay. very sure. generously offered to come here. And what, what I'm giving you is a keychain because no one has keys anymore, but maybe you have a clicker for your car. <laughs> Um, a refrigerator magnet, and um, from the from our DAR library, the papers of James Madison, Volume Six. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that you do not have this. Oh, your your refrigerator magnet is. Okay. Thank you so much. So, I truly appreciate. Oh my goodness, yeah, this is a marvelous volume. So, I do not have it. I am the proud owner. of 30 of the 100 biographies of Madison so far. Wow. 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 It is my project to write to the authors of every living biography, uh, praising them their, from their book. Have you ever done a book report? Mm -hmm. 30 times in a row? <laughs> <laughs> so, I am deeply appreciated. Well, we're, we're thrilled that you were able to be here. So, thank you. Thank you so much for what you about. Oh, background. gladly. Bill Lewis is a computer scientist. Um, I've taught at uh, Stanford and Tufts universities. I had the honor of working in uh, genetic research at MIT for the last uh, previous uh, 10 years. Okay. I, I say that my boss is going to get the Nobel Prize. If you're familiar with the Human Genome Project, he is the principal on it. And one atom. One atom of that Nobel Prize is going to be, to be due to my work. And I'm very, very proud of that, Adam. Where do you come from right now? Where do you live? Oh, I, I love to, uh, re to tell people that James Madison came from Orange County, Virginia. Bill Lewis comes from Orange County, California. And now he resides in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Oh, okay. Where are you off to next after today? Oh, uh, I was in a conference down in uh, New York, so I visited my old friends Rufus King, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, uh, Robert R. Livingston, uh, Thomas Paine, and I'm just winding up here at the uh, Olive Oil Group House. So I'm exhausted but feel wonderful. I had a marvelous time. So Connecticut back then was considered like the one of the best states you could live in. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, uh, the corruption here is minimal. Uh, the, the whole uh, Calvinist, the new light Calvinism, all, I don't understand it. But yes. So what happened? <laughs> How did we go downhill? Happily, having been dead these past 100 years, <laughs> you're gonna be PC on that. <laughs> okay, thank you. So all these um, 
the squeezes that you have? Who paid for that? Well, I believe I paid for a good deal of it. And that's why you died in debt. That certainly helped. <laughs> uh, uh, after retirement, it was felt reasonable for anyone to come and visit and stay with us for a night, a week. We would typically have 20 people staying at Montpelier any evening. Oh. Mm. And so, yes, it's um, expensive and I had this preference for French wines. And, <laughs> oh, okay. <Oof>. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, the same thing happened to Washington. You probably all read the biography of Washington, but um, as you say, 12 people, 20 people come and stay for two, three, four weeks. Mm -hmm. And he also died. He, he had a lot of land. And I know that you had much land also, 5,000 acres. Sola, Sola, Sola. Me, uh, uh, Monroe, and, uh, 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 Jefferson. and Jefferson. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, of course, Washington, George Washington was extremely wealthy. Um, he, and Mar he married Martha. Martha was wealthy. Uh, he was doing well, but he really <laughs> married my <Martha>, yes. <laughs> <laughs> which, was, which was a good thing, because he um, did not take a salary as president. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether the subsequent presidents did. They needed to. I, we certainly did, and we had some amount of salary. Mm -hmm. um, but all of us spent our money. as We, we did not make a profit in that respect. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. What were your feelings on the War of 1812? <laughs> the War of 1812, Mr. Madison's War, they called it. As you know, at the end of the Revolution, we signed the Treaty of Paris and we sort of had things down. And then, of course, Britain and France with their eternal wars, they were stopping our ships. They were taking our sailors. Uh, we proposed and instituted an embargo, which lasted off and on from, I think, 1800 through 1812. And it was, some people say it was completely ineffective, partially effective. In any case, it did not work. Over the years, 15,000 American sailors were taken off of our ships forced to work to death in British warships. You expected, your expected life span was two years as a common seaman on a British ship of the line. So, wow. okay. Do you know what is the population of America today? 300 million. Okay, so this would be the equivalent of approximately one million Americans being shanghai and kidnapped. So I felt it imperative. We had to fight. There was no question. We didn't have we didn't have the ability. We had no army to speak of. We had our navy was Washington's six frigates and a bunch of sloops and gunboats. And yet, if we did not declare war, Congress would never provide for war and it would never happen, and we would become slaves to Europe. And I initiated the war, Congress voted for it, and then we got to find out whether the Second Amendment worked or not. Could American militias, brave American soldiers who spent the weekends practicing their musket fire, marching, and then retiring to the tavern for a beer, could they stand up against the battle-hardened troops that have fought in Europe for the last seven years against Napoleon? Uh, no. I did not work. It was a complete and utter disaster. And the, the only thing that saved us in the beginning of the war was Washington's six frigates. And I had opposed those frigates. I had voted against them, but they, they saved the nation. I mean, it's an trivial number. Six frigates. We had fewer ships, in the, we had fewer cannon than the British had ships. Wow. A ship of the line, a 74 cannon ship of the line against a mere frigate. Uh, you didn't even fight that battle. And 
and by some miracle we didn't have to, our frigates went one on one with their ships. Uh, I'm sure you are aware of the great escape of, of the Constitution from the British fleet. Yes. An incredible, incredible accomplishment that uh, Sawyer had, Admiral Sawyer had come down, he had a ship of the line, the Africa, uh, first line, first class 74. We had 44 gun frigate. And he had two frigates, several sloops, and for three days they chased us with zero wind, and we put the men out in the long boats to row ahead. And they took all of their long boats from all of their ships, put it on their frigate Shannon to catch up with us, and through the uh, brilliance of one of his younger officers, they took out a kedging anchor. And so we would row out far in front of the ship, drop the anchor, and then men on the turnbuckles could, capstans could pull it in and pull the ship forward, leaving the British just a little bit further behind. And every time there was a breath of wind, men rushed up, pour water down the sails to wet the sails to catch every breath of wind that there was and the skill required to bring those long boats on board as the ship was moving because the British were right behind us. If they forced us into action then we were lost. And yet they pulled it off. So it was an incredible, incredible accomplishment and after that in the actual battles, of course, you know the Constitution proved to be a vastly superior ship, a vastly superior crew, and a vastly superior captain. So, President, were you involved with um, the pirates in the Mediterranean, our first terrorist encounter? So that, of course, was uh, my best friend, uh, Thomas Jefferson. Oh, that was Jefferson, okay. And of course, this Sorry. is where those frigates first proved their value. Okay. We're still dealing with them. <laughs> oh my goodness. But uh, there it is. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure. I am going to stay for as long as anyone is around. I'm happy to talk about anything whatsoever.